Welcome back. In this episode, we're going to uh, look at a different method of displacing electrons. In the previous episodes, we mostly leaned on a chemical reaction to rip electrons away from atoms and pull them over to a terminal on a battery that was marked negative, leaving the atoms that are missing electrons over here wanting them back. And they can't go this way through the battery but if you connect a circuit from the negative to the plus, they'll go around through the circuit to get back to the atoms that they were ripped off of and do some work on the way through. But that's direct current. It always goes in the same direction, minus to plus. Now, electrons always flow minus to plus, but with a battery, you've all, it's direct current. It is just in one direction all the time. So now we're going to start talking about displacing electrons from atoms by using a magnetic field moving through a conductor and pushing the electrons off of the atoms in one direction or moving the conductor through the magnetic field to push the electrons off of the atoms. And when you move the conductor through one way through the field, the electrons go one way and when you pull it back through the field, they go the other way. So alternating current. Let's uh, take a look at that. Okay, here we have a, a loop of copper wire represented by the reddish circle with the blue inside of it. So this is a loop of copper wire suspended in space. And then we have magnetic flux or lines of force that are traveling from the bottom of the image towards the top. Now, remember the influence that these electrons have on each other, that positive repels well, negative repels negative, positive repels positive, negative attracts positive, and so forth. So, remember, each electron is a little magnet of its own. So, if we take an external magnetic field and apply it to that copper conductor, those electrons are going to feel that. However, the electrons are in the loop of wire are only going to move when the magnetic field is moving. So, we can either... We can move the loop of conductor back and forth through the magnetic field to get the electrons in the loop of copper to move, or we can move the magnetic field in and out of the loop. So I'm gonna run this little uh, video clip here. I did not create this, I got this off the web. And what you'll see, you have two graphs there. If you look in the lower left-hand corner, a blue and a green, the blue is going to be movement of the magnetic field. Now remember, you could take and hold the copper loop stationary and then take a magnet, like a bar magnet in your hand and move it in and out of the copper loop or closer to it and further away. And that's one way to get a result. Or you can hold the magnet still stationary and then move the copper conductor back and forth in the magnetic field. But when you have a magnetic field, remember that magnetic field is produced by electrons who have all aligned their magnetic polarity to make one big magnetic field. When you impose that on a copper conductor that has free electrons, the electrons in that copper loop are going to come under its influence, but only when something's moving. So if you move the copper wire through the field, then as you move through the field, the field is going to displace those electrons and make them move. If you reverse the direction, then the electrons are going to go in the other direction. Or, instead of moving the magnetic field, move the conductor, and when either way, something's moving. Or you can move them both at the same time. Normally, you just move one. So think about this. If this were in outer space, you wouldn't know which was moving. You would just see that there's motion between the two. So let's run this little graphic. And first, the magnetic field is going to become more dense, and as it goes in, it induces a current. Notice that magnetic field comes out from the conductor because the electrons are now lined up and moving. Or you can rotate it. Notice the magnetic field that results from the electrons moving in the copper wire. It's interesting to point out that when you use a magnetic field, in motion to get electrons to move in the conductor, that electron flow produces now a magnetic field that opposes the one that produced it. It's called counter EMF, C-E-M-F. 
this takes a little bit of pondering, but the important thing to remember is if you have a conductor and you have a magnetic field and you place them in proximity, if you move one, it's going to affect the other. So you're going to get movement of electrons in that copper wire, whether you move the copper wire in and out of the field or move the, the field back and forth across the copper wire. That is electromagnetic induction. You're inducing current flow in that conductor because you're passing magnetic lines of force through that conductor, which influences those free electrons to move. And they're all going to move in the same direction because that's based on polarity. So as you slide the magnetic field through the copper wire, the electrons all go one direction. And when you bring it back, they reverse and all go the other direction. That would be alternating current. Okay, you're continually alternating the direction that the magnetic field is moving through the conductor. Therefore, the movement of the electrons in the conductor alternate back and forth. What we have here is a coil of conductor, which is a partial spool of red 18 gauge conductor. Right on the spool it came on, I just pulled the ends off and hooked it up to the Arceval meter movement. What you're going to do is watch this needle. Now you can see just getting the magnet near this coil of wire, you can see some movement of the needle. I'm going to slide it inside. You can see that you can almost get the meter to peg. Notice that if I pull it this direction, the current goes one way. If I push it in, it goes the other. Is that if I pull it back and forth, I can keep the current flowing, but it's alternating in direction. It goes first one direction, then the other direction. Now remember that there's a spring on this needle, so it tends to bounce. So let it settle down. Okay, now, so what we have here, this is a very strong permanent magnet. Okay, and that's why I have it taped to the stick, because they're just very powerful and it's hard to remove them from ferromagnetic material once they attach and the stick helps. Now remember that inside of this permanent magnet are molecules called domains or dipoles. And each of these molecules have a north and a south pole. In most ferromagnetic material, they are randomly oriented and they cancel each other. In this particular material, this was manufactured as a permanent magnet. So they forced all the domains to be all lined up in one direction and then solidified the material and that forms a permanent magnet. But the magnetic field from this magnet comes from the electrons in the magnet. Remember, electrons repel electrons. So this copper wire here, you're, you're looking at the red plastic insulate, insulation. But inside the insulation is copper wire and that copper is made up of the copper atoms that we've shown earlier in this presentation. So when I move this magnet in here, the electrons in the magnet, the magnetic field from the electrons in the magnet, repel the electrons in the copper wire. Now another phenomena I want you to notice, I'm going to hold this as stationary as I possibly can, and I'm going to disturb the magnetic field with a screwdriver. Whoop. See how hard that is to get off of there? So I'm going to hold this down a little bit better and watch the needle. Can you see the needle moving? The needle is moving because when I bring this ferromagnetic material in here, it is intensifying the magnetic field because the magnetic field moves with less resistance through ferromagnetic material than it does through air. That causes the magnetic field to move. So this is how a proximity sensor works. A proximity sensor actually has a electromagnet, not a permanent magnet, and it has a coil of conductor. And this is stationary, and when a metal object moves by, see the needle moving? When an object moves by, it disturbs the magnetic field, and the current flowing in the sensor amplifier, which would be this device now, senses that change in the magnetic field and says, aha, there's an object there. Another thing to point out is that if I slide the magnet in and out, you see that I can maintain current flow. But I can also move the coil of conductor. I don't have to move the magnet. I can move them both and get a lot. So something has to be moving. If you move the magnet, the electrons in the magnet moves the electrons in the wire. 
if you move the wire then the electrons in the conductor moving against the field created by the electrons in the magnet cause current flow. So it doesn't matter which one you move. Move the coil, move the magnets, or move both. Another thing I wanted to show you is you see when you have a big loop of wire you get a lot of heavy action. But if I just pass it by a single conductor, in other words if I separate out one conductor here, you see the, the needle motion? Because the magnet only has influence over the electrons in this small area of the conductor, so you only get a little bit of induced current. But when you do it inside the coil, you the magnet, the permanent magnet, is influencing all the electrons on this full length of this wire because it's wrapped up in a coil, as opposed to getting just a tiny little deflection on the meter from this motion. In our previous demonstration, we demonstrated electron flow or current flow by either moving a coil of conductor through a magnetic field or moving the magnetic field through the coil of conductor. In the diagram here we have a single loop of conductor and in that conductor the electrons are traveling around in one direction which means that all of their magnetic fields join together to form one magnetic field that surrounds that loop. In this little animation, which I did not create, I got it off of the web, we see what happens when you have many loops of conductor and you have current flowing through it. The individual magnetic fields of the individual loops all join together to make one intense magnetic field and the magnetic field inside the coil is very intense. This form is called a solenoid and that intense magnetic field inside of the solenoid is used to attract ferromagnetic material like a rod against a spring to pull it into the center of the coil and then when you turn the coil off the spring pulls it back out. So energizing the coil pulls the rod in, de-energize the spring pulls it back out. That's solenoid motion. Okay, here's another animation that I did not create. I got it off the web. And if anybody sees their material on here and they want credit, you just email me and I'll put some credits at the beginning or the end. Now here what we have, and I'm gonna pause this a minute. Notice that we have a rotating loop of conductor. And at the end of the loops, outside the magnetic field, there are we'll call them, if you like, split rings. They're called commutator segments. So the upper end of the loop is connected to the blue piece of metal, curved metal, and the bottom of this loop of conductor is attached to the red. So as the loop of conductor rotates inside of the magnetic field, those commutator segments rotate with it attached or I should say in electrical contact with the commutator segments are brushes. Those are the two little dark gray rectangles that then have copper wires leaving them and going over to the battery. So here's the idea. With that battery in place you're going to have current flow. You see positive on one end of the battery. On the other end electrons are going to flow through the copper wire up to the top through the brush into the blue commutator segment out through the top half of that loop, down the other end, and then back across the bottom of the loop to the red segment, out of the brush on the bottom, through the copper wire, and order the positive end of the battery. As the current flows through that loop, those electrons flowing through that loop, all of their magnetic fields add together. That magnetic field opposes the magnetic field of the horseshoe magnet, and something's got to move. Since the horseshoe magnet can't move, then the loop moves. So really you could say that the electrons flowing through the loop create a magnetic field on the loop and the horseshoe magnet, since it's stationary, that forces the magnetic field on the loop, the rotating loop to move. So let's continue this on and you see that in order to keep this thing moving, you have to keep reversing the polarity through the loop because once the loop repelled around in one direction, 
it would be attracted and then line up and stop. So just as soon as the loop gets in the position to where the North Pole has reached, the North Pole on the loop has reached the North, I'm sorry, the, the North Pole on the loop has reached the South Pole on the horseshoe magnet, it would attract and stop right there. Right at that instant, the commutator segments are in a posi position where we reverse the current flow and now we've reversed the magnetic polarity of the loop and so what was attracting is now repellent and it just keeps going around in a rotary motion. Okay, this looks like the exact same device. Actually, the whoever created this animation rotated the horseshoe magnet around perpendicular and it really doesn't matter because the magnetic field is still passing through the loop and then they've attached something to external to mechanically make the loop move through the magnetic field of the horseshoe magnet. Remember in the previous animation you had a battery that pushed electricity through the loop and then the magnetic field of the loop working with the magnetic field of the horseshoe magnet forced motion of that loop. So the magnetic field produced by the loop fighting against the magnetic field of the horseshoe magnet gave you your motion. In this case we're going to do just the opposite. We're going to take an, a, an external mechanical means, in this case we'll say a windmill, and we're going to rotate that loop. And as that loop rotates around through the magnetic field, the magnetic field of the horseshoe magnet is going to force electrons to move in the loop. And the electrons will flow, you know, in one, in one case they'll flow out through the blue commutator segment up through the brush down and over through that light bulb and then back to the bottom into the red commutator segment and back into the loop. So we have a permanent magnet with a stationary magnetic field. We have a single loop of wire or conductor that is rotated by wind energy. We have the loop is extended outside of the rotation of, by commutator segments. Now if you think about this the loop that we're inducing current flow into continues through the segments, through the brush, through the wire, through the light bulb, through the wire, through a brush, back into the other commutator segment, back to the rotating loop. So this is really one loop of conductor. That includes the commutator segments, the brushes, and the little light bulb. So when we rotate this, uh, a little bit later in this animation, you'll see the light bulb will blink as the current is being induced into the conductor. And then, of course, we'll have rotating in contact with stationary brushes. So the commutator segments are being rotated in contact with the brushes, and the brushes maintain the electrical connection. And then we have a complete circuit through the filament of the light bulb. Remember, the filament of the light bulb is a conductor. So, we'll take and rotate the magnet around, we'll get rid of the battery, and we'll replace it with a light bulb, which is a load, and then the air will force the coil to move. That induces current flow. You can barely see the bulb illuminating, but it is illuminating. There you have a mild introduction to displacing electrons with electromagnetic force. The one of the two has to be moving. You either have to move the conductor, the wire, through the magnetic field or move the magnetic field through the conductor. As long as one of them is moving, then you get a current induced. It actually pushes electrons. As long as the magnetic field is going through the wire, electrons are moving. If, if both stop moving, whether you're stop moving the magnet or stop moving the wire, electrons stop moving. That's why when you move the magnet one way through the wire, current goes one way, and when you stop, the current stops. And then when you pull it back this way, then the electrons go that way, and then they stop. So they go one direction, the other direction, one direction, the other direction. So if you can build an apparatus, like you saw in the little clips, where you can take and rotate a coil through a magnetic field you will just get a continuous alternating current. Now there is a way to turn that into DC and that is with those commutator segments that you saw in the one little clip where the ring 
that the contacts are rubbing on, it's split. So just as the wire gets to the point where the current's going to reverse, the contacts reverse. So although the current is reversing in the coil, on the other side of the contacts where you're actually doing the work, it's always going the same direction. But it's going increase to zero, increase to zero, but it never reverses. So in the coil, the part that's rotating the magnetic field, it's going this way, then that way, this way, then that way. But the commutator segments take and do a switcheroo on the contacts going outside of the generator. So it's going this way and back to zero. And right then the contacts switch. So the current outside of the coil goes this way and back. Maximum zero, maximum zero. So you get a, um, it's DC, but it's going from zero to something, back to zero to something. It's not smooth. It's got a ripple, but it can still do work. So that was a decent introduction to alternating current, but mainly displacing electrons off of atoms in a conductive material by moving a magnetic field through it or moving the conductor through the magnetic field. Both of them can move. But one of them's got to be moving, otherwise you get no induced current. So DC does not induce any current. So if you turn on a DC device, the current builds up. And while the current is going from zero up to maximum, the magnetic field is expanding. During that time, it will induce a current in any conductors around it. But as soon as it gets up to maximum, that's it. And then when you turn it off, it drops back down. The field collapses, and when the field drops back down, and it passes through conductors. They're just a momentary little spike of induced current, and that's it. In the next episode, we'll probably go back to tin Tinkercad, and we'll probably introduce something called Ohm's Law, O-H-M, Ohm's Law, uh, a very important thing for you to understand. Now, you can understand electricity and appreciate it and respect it, but you can't design or work with it unless you can measure it and articulate the quantities. That's where Ohm's law comes into practice. So you've got voltage, which is pressure. And then if you've got a conductor in the pressure, you've got amperage, which is current flow. And whatever the current flows through that conductor or that piece of material, it has opposition. It doesn't just let electricity go running through it scot-free free of any imp uh, impedance or impediment. So the measure of how much a material resist your efforts to rip electrons off and move them down through the thing, that's called resistance. So you've got E for voltage, I for current, and R for resistance. We're going to do that in the next episode. Thank you. But wait, there's one more thing. There's always one more thing. When you are moving the magnet back and forth through the wire, or let's say the magnet's sitting still, and you're moving the coil of the wire back and forth through the magnetic field to generate electricity, if that coil has no load on it, you're just going to move that coil back and forth. But if you were to attach a load to the ends of that coil, in other words, if you took that coil and the two ends hooked them up to a light bulb, and you're doing this, when you flip the switch, it's all of a sudden going to get harder because your arm moving the magnet is pushing electrons and trying to force them through a material that has resistance and make it hot. So you're taking your body energy, mechanical energy, electrical energy to heat. So if you had one of those little hand crank generators, you don't see them around much anymore. If it has no load on it, you're just sitting there cranking like this. But if you switch in a load, then it's maybe I can dig up one. I'm sure I'm not going to go spend money on one, but I bet I can find a video of somebody using one. If I can find it, I'll put it on another episode. That's the last thing for this one. I promise.